Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to our midweek video this week. We appreciate you tuning in as always. I am a day late on this video. Normally I try to put one of these out on Thursday. It is Friday, November 17. So hopefully I'm not also a dollar short in addition to being a day late on this video. I want to welcome you to this uh, to our YouTube channel here, Grace Life Bible on YouTube. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing. And ringing the alarm bell is a way of staying current with the ministry when we go live from the assembly building on Sunday morning, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt text site. Should something happen to our YouTube channel, so if you're into alt text sites or like an alternative to YouTube, please consider checking us out and subscribing on Rumble as well. My featured books this week are, once again, my co-authored book with my former professor, Dr. Dale DeWitt, J.C. O'Hare and the Origins of the American Grace Movement, 1899 to 1958. Uh, this is a full-length featured church history book uh, dedicated to studying the uh, life, ministry, and theological development of J.C. O'Hare as the fountainhead of the American Grace Movement here in the United States. Um a lot of subject matters that are covered in that book that are going to that dovetail with what I'm going to be covering in this video as it relates to um, Hummel's treatment of the rise and fall of dispensationalism. And again, my second featured book is once again, Rightly Dividing E.W. Bollinger, Assessing His Life, Ministry and Impact. This book uh, talks about the not just uh, some things about the life of Bollinger, but also, most importantly, the theological development uh, in his life as he is, by the end of the 19th century, the late 1800s, espousing uh, a form of mid-axe dispensationalism, and then how over the next decade and a half, he eventually changes his mind and becomes sort of the uh, main proponent of what becomes known as Acts 28 dispensationalism. So if you're into the history of dispensationalism, you want to know about two key important figures, you're going to want to check out these books uh, for yourself. We'd appreciate you doing that as a way of supporting the ministry. We've been talking here throughout the summer and fall on um, reviewing Hummel's book, The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. This is going to be episode 17. And the subtitle of the book is How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation by Daniel G. Hummel. Where we find ourselves right now in our treatment of this is right here in chapter 11, Scholastic Dispensationalism. As always, there's an introduction to each chapter, and then there are normally four, sometimes three subsections. And so we want to look at this subject matter here on the scope development of Scholastic Dispensationalism now in chapter 11. So getting right into it, starting on page 173. Um, in the last video, we went through some stuff about the history of, of uh, fundamentalism, uh, different factions that emerged within fundamentalism. There was a denominational focus for some to try to reclaim the denominations uh, from theological liberalism and modernism. And then there was another focus that was sort of more uh, culturally, culturally based that focused on ev combating evolution. Uh, in Hummel's words, that was embracing uh, Christian nationalism and was was more uh, focused on those issues. Now, in this chapter, he's going to talk about sort of a third subcategory that didn't really fit into either one of the two that we talked about in the last chapter, but was really just more interested in theology and getting things right in that sense. So on page 173, second chapter, he talks about the WCFA, which stands for World Christian Fundamentals, Fundamentals Association, okay? The WCA was in many ways the most direct successor to the pre-war, pre-World War I premillennialism. Sitting uneasily alongside denominational and nationalist fundamentalism, the WCFA comprised interdenominationalists who fell through the fundamentalist cracks, who were less concerned with the contest for denominations or culture but were still focused on the theological and cultural identity of the church, broadly constructed to include local churches, small denominations, parachurch organizations, and missions agencies. They worked through loosely organized affiliations like the WCFA and the American 
conference of undenominational churches and later creations such as the IFCA, Independent, Independent Fundamentalist Churches of America, a lack of pre-existing institutional structures meant that shared markers of belief, especially premillennialism, became central to interdenominational fundamentalist identity. So this is a group that is more interested in, in my assessment, getting their theology right than they are necessarily and, and, and the culture within local churches and within Christian organizations than they are about things happening in the culture or in the denominational structures. While some interdenominationalists followed Riley, Riley's, led, Riley's lead into anti-evolution and other nationalist campaigns, a smaller group led by Lewis Perry Chafer, Schofield's most distinguished disciple, formed a scholastic community that was less immediately concerned with winning back the denominations or the nation, they had a longer view of the purpose of fundamentalism. The scholastics began to form their own institutions to advance their theology anchored in new premillennialism. They would make up the core of early dispensational theologians, Tied to Bible Institutes and Global Missions Agency, scholastic dispensationalists work to create a theological tr tradition less interested in serving fundamentalism than in perfecting their species of premillennialism and constructing a full systematic theology to establish the credentials of dispensationalism. Okay, so what they're interested in is establishing and systematizing dispensational theology and getting it a seat at the academic theological table, so to speak. Okay. And this is what Schaefer is going to be very good at uh, with his founding of Dallas Theological Seminary, his <clears throat> writing of his systematic theology books, um, etc. By weaving new premillennialism, higher life teaching, and shared fundamentalist teaching into the original theological tapestry Early dispensationalists strengthened their interlocking systems of teaching. Their theology surpassed, sorry, suppressed its sophistication, popularity, and longevity, brethren. The new premillennialist and sorry, new premillennialist predecessors, as well as revival fundamentalist varieties, scholastic dispensationalism gave gave shape to both a highly technical theological conversation and popular expression of fundamentalist theology. This tradition came in, into full bloom in the midst of a deep fundamentalist infighting and was deeply shaped by its outcome. So a third group that's going to emerge from all of the fundamentalist factions and infighting, et cetera, that are happening in the 1920s is a group that is going to be intimately focused on trying to stake out and get dispensational theology a seat at the academic table and, and and give it credentials as a as a legitimate theology okay uh, which is an interesting concept to consider and the first subsection is uh, is titled the rise and splintering of the of world christian fundamentalist association so this section is really going to be about sort of the the two, the two different approaches that emerge here okay one is going to be spearheaded by William Bell Riley, the author of a very popular book called The Menace of Modernism. And Riley is going to be very much more concerned with embracing culture, etc. So a couple things about him, okay? Uh, page 175, Riley called for a Christian confederacy, borrowing from a passage in Isaiah 8, to counter looming consolidation of religion headed by the Federal Council of Churches, that concerned that sorry that cornered the market on quote close interdenominational cooperation where the federal council channeled mo uh, channeled modernist theology riley wanted a base of close fellowship yea even an organization of true evangelical conservatives on loyalty to uh, biblical precepts and even and even evangelization of the globe the basis for unity was in the alarming threat of modernism Riley hoped to rally churches, schools, and other Christian institutions to stake their existence on the proposition that the Bible was the very word of God and is therefore the most 
must forever remain the only rule of faith and practice. Okay. Now let me just say, like, I, I agree with what Riley's position on that, obviously, but he's going to be taking a different track. Okay. Uh, bottom of page 175, the conference led to the creation of the Christian Fundamentalist Bible Conference Association, later named the World Christian Fundamentalist Association, the WCFA. The nine-point creedal statement adopted at the 1919 conference resembled the 14-point Niagara Creed of 1878, even as it was less than a quarter the length. So it was a little bit shorter. It was shorter, obviously. Then he talks about um, the Niagara Creed had come largely from the mind of one person, James H. Brooks, and represented his attempt to channel new premillennial and higher life energies into a Bible conference network. The 1919 statement, on the other hand, was drafted by a committee reacting to the perceived inroads of modernism. It proclaimed the historicity of the, the historicity of the virgin birth, the resurrection, and the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. And in a final article, it elevated premillennialism alongside these other issues. We believe in that blessed hope, the personal premillennial and imminent return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Offering a fraction of the detail, the Niagara, Niagara's correlating article, which included, quote, the present dispensation, millennial age, and restoration of Israel, the 1919 statement simply added the keyword imminent to signal the preference to signal the preference of any moment rapture as a marker of right belief. So again, these things are these things are all happening here as different factions are emerging. This particular faction, the uh, WCFA, does include a a uh, an article in their statement related to dispensational premillennialism that talks about the imminent rapture. So while not as robust as earlier statements, it definitely was there. Okay. Um, then he goes on. He he talks a more a little bit about the history of the of the uh, WCFA. Uh, for these fundamentalists, premillennialism was true in a doctrinal sense, but it was more importantly a position of dogma that differentiated them from modernists. So they did not they believed it, but they did not have the same commitment to it that say Schaefer is going to have. Okay. Um, he talks about how this cooperation that existed within the WCFA was, was limited. Um, Pentecostals did not meet with the approval of everyone in the interdenominational fold. Lewis Barrett Schaefer, one of the speakers at the 1919 conference and prominent disciple of Schofield, privately chastised Norris in late 1923, declaring that McPherson's teaching on the second baptism of the spirit was, quote, one of the greatest errors of our time. The following year, Chafer used Gable Lines, our hope, our ma his, Gable Lines magazine, Our Hope, to urge fundamentalist, fundamentalist med leaders to disassociate from Pentecostals. So you have that going on. Um, you have, and then Chafer is going to begin his sort of main push. While, again, page 177, while Riley's leadership increasingly saw fundamentalism's purpose as waging a nationalist culture war, the scholastic faction led by Chafer began to plan schools that would expand educational the educational reach of the fundamentalist theology, namely new premillennialism. Those who joined Chafer in distancing themselves from the WCFA and its um, and its culture war style were increasingly becoming and being seen by another fundamental by other fundamentalists and partisans of fundamentalism more than a as more than a fundamentalism group. Now there's a lot of kind of talk there. So what that means is basically that Schaefer's dispensationalism is going to be seen. Let me let me try another swing at this. Style of culture war was increasingly becoming and being seen by other fundamentalists as partisans of pre-millennialism um, more than of fundamentalism. So again, this speaks to the rift that was happening uh, surrounding dispensationalism, okay? So while Riley is writing a book called Monis, The uh, Mo Menace of Modernism, Chafer is writing a book about salvation that is systematizing views on how salvation works, okay? 
So the next subsection is Lewis Perry Chafer and the Origins of Scholastic Dispensationalism. If Riley was the undisputed leader of the WC, w, WCFA, it was the dissenting Lewis Perry Chafer who was most successfully undermined his leadership that led to the breakaway of the scholastic faction. Contra to WCFA's current issues posture, Schaefer envisioned a vision training a new generation of ministers in the theology of premillennialism and placing them in the existing denominations to turn the tide of modernism over the coming decades. Prioritizing theological education instead of culture war, Schaefer's approach was the first sign that more bookish fundamentalists might organize on their own. In this sense, Riley and Schaefer represent two divergent impulses. From a distance, the two men appeared to be co-belligerents, and yet a closer look reveals competing priorities that would shape the future of fundamentalism. So again, like I've said, Schaefer is an academic. Schaefer is not so much interested in the, in the engagement politi politically, culturally, etc., as he is systematizing, training men theologically, getting them out there in churches and turning the tide against modernism through a more academic approach. Okay. Um, he goes into some history on page 179 of, of where Schaefer fits into um, a sequence of, of, of premillennial leaders, including Moody. Schaefer, too young to personally know Moody, briefly attended voice classes at the Chicago Evan Evangelical Ev I can't read this morning, folks. I apologize. Voice classes at the Chicago Evangelistic Society in 1893 and 1900 moved to Northfield, Massachusetts, where he came under the tutelage of Cyrus Schofield. Now, just as a brief point, Darby comes to the United States and teaches Brooks. James H. Brooks teaches Schofield. Schofield teaches Lewis Berry Chafer, and Lewis Berry Chafer is one of the prime teachers of Charles F. Baker, who, along with J.C. O'Hare and C.R. Stam, become key in the formation of the American Grace Movement. So there is a lineage from Baker to Chafer to Schofield to Brooks to Darby, direct lineage in that sort of theological teaching to one of the first um, mid-acts dispensationalists, which was um, Dr. Charles F. Baker, okay? So Chafer is, is uh, very important in this sequence, okay? At this point, the two men's stories began to diverge, pointing the ways, pointing the ways their fundamentalist organizations in the 1920s take different shapes. Riley landed the pastor to the First Baptist Church of Minneapolis in 1897 and modeled its expansive reach and services on Moody's Church in Chicago. Riley's congregation grew to thousands of members and offered a Bible institute, social services, and Sunday schools to attract a growing middle class in the Twin Cities. So that's what Riley is doing, okay? Schaefer is going to be advancing along a different line. Schaefer's experience of the same decades was quite different. After moving to Northfield in 1900, he continued to travel as an evangelist, setting up Southfield Bible Conferences in Crescent City, Florida, as a complement to the work in Northfield. At this time, Schaefer developed a close relationship with Schofield, under whom he, um, under, under whom he um, apprenticed and was tutored in ways of defining, categorizing, and interpreting scripture. Schofield's remarkable power of um, con condescension of scripture, Chafer later reflected, contributed to unveiling Chafer's, quote, ignorance of the fundamentals, fundamental truths of the Bible. So he's more theologically attuned, if I could say it that way, than what Riley was doing. Not to say Riley wasn't theologically astute, but Chafer is just advancing in a different way. By World War I, Chafer had transformed himself into a interdenominational Bible teacher and promoter of dispensational time. Yet unlike Riley, whose attention was fixed on combating modernism in American churches and culture, Chafer turned his talent towards systematizing 
his theology. The same year that Riley published The Menace of Modernism, Schaefer published Salvation, that's 1917, a work, a work with not one reference to current events that was in no way intended to be a contribution to commentary or to, to contemporary theological discussion. The terms liberal and modernist made no appearance, and besides the indebtedness to Schofieldian concepts of free grace, the book would be hard to date to 1917 uh, rather than 30 years before. Chafer fashioned his work to ignore its historical movement, while Riley's writings were a direct response to it. So there's a direct difference. Riley is writing to respond to contemporary issues that are happening in the church with modernism, and Schaefer is trying to write, dare I say, timeless theology that transcends current events. Okay. So um, a lot more things are said on page 182. Um, for example, a more rigorous institution was needed if pastors were to be fundamentalist Bible expositors rather than the rabble rousers. A planning, a planning for the ambitiously named Evangelical Theological College proceeded, reflecting the British understanding of college shared by uh, Winchester and Thomas, the actions of the WCFA only contributed to, to Schaefer's desire to create an independent venture. It would be too bad if the new school was linked in any way with fundamentalism. Schaefer, or sorry, Gabeline wrote Schaefer announcing elsewhere in late 1923, I believe the days of the fundamentalist movement are numbered. The institution that Schaefer envisioned opened its doors in October 1924 in downtown Dallas, near where Schaefer was pastoring named the newly renamed Schofield Memorial Church. With the library donated by the recently deceased W.H. Griffin Thomas and land purchased in 1926, the school, which was renamed Dallas Theological Seminary in 1936, became the center for advanced new premillennialist education. The school <clears throat> celebrated its first commencement in 1925, awarding two degrees, and boasted a graduating class of 25 by 1936. The majority of the early faculty were students, and students were Presbyterian, Northern, Southern, and Canadian, with seven of the, of the first 11 faculty ordained as Southern Presbyterian clergy. None of the original faculty held PhDs, and because Schaefer subscribed to the faith principle as many missions agencies uh, that there should be no direct solicitation of funds the early years of the school were mired in financial distress faculty unrest and institutional reorganization in this the early years of dallas theological seminary mir mirrored fundamentalism writ large so dallas theological seminary is going to emerge as a institution that is going to be teaching what becomes known as scholastic dispensationalism this is a systematized version of the Schofieldian dispensationalism that was present in the Schofield Reference Bible. Chafer is going to turn this into a very sort of scholastic enterprise. Now, the next subsection of chapter 11 is Norris, Rice, and Jones, separatist fundamentalists. Okay. Before we do that, though, just one brief word here on the end of the previous subsection. But for, uh, let's see here, but for stitching together a different Christian identity steeped in the theology of dispensational time and new premillennialism, the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary would turn out to be one of the most consequential events in the history of dispensationalism. So this is a very big deal in the history of dispensationalism, even as uh, groups like O'Hare, and others are going to get started because the brand of dispensationalism that is going to be taught by Dallas is going to be become sort of the normative dispensational view over time. OK, now these other guys in uh, uh, Norris Rice and Jones, um, they're another stripe, if you will, of fundamentalism during this time. Um, not going to say necessarily a whole lot about them. 
They're covered here on page, uh, beginning at the bottom, page 183, uh, 184, 185. They talk about Bob Jones um, University being founded, um, different things that are going on here. Let me just read sort of the conclusion here. Very little was systematized and even less was intended as scholarly contribution to the education of future pastors. The separatists would play an important role in giving dispensationalism a wider receptive audience and infusing premillennialism to a conservative, even right-wing politics. But what separatists would not do is embrace, what separatists would not do is engage in scholastic theological discourse or seek in any seek in any systematic way to educate fundamentalists on a particular doctrine of eschatology. So they're sort of taking a different approach than what Chafer and what Riley were taking. So I really want to get into this last subsection of the chapter. Lewis Berry Chafer embraces dispensationalism. In 1936, the same year he renamed his school Dallas Theological Seminary, Lewis Berry Chafer was forced to contend with a growing chorus of critics from <clears throat> seemingly all sectors of fundamentalism. Using the pages of the seminary's newly acquired journal, Bibliotheca Sacra, Chafer identified himself publicly for the first time as a dispensationalist. A term having been coined by Morrow less than a decade earlier had become common parlance among fundamentalists critical of the theology. Dispensationalism distinguished a particular lineage of biblical interpretation and theological reasoning in the fundamentalist fold, one that Morrow insisted was foreign to the movement's true aims. To outside observers, including most modernists, the distinction between a premillennialist and a dispensationalist was inconsequential. Go figure. Premillennialists are dispensational. Dispensationalists are premillennial. So go figure that people from the outside looking in can't distinguish a difference between a premillennialist and a dispensationalist, okay? To Chafer, however, the difference dogged him daily. As other fundamentalists attacked his teachings as modern, illogical, and extreme, finally, in October 1936, Chafer published a 60-page, 25,000-word rejoinder simply, titled simply Dispensationalism. He wrote in exacting detail against the criticisms level at the complete religious system he unofficially held. All Christians were at least partial dispensationalists, he mused, in that they acknowledged the Old and the New Testament and did not follow ancient Israelite sacrificial practices. So Schaefer said, all you guys are dispensational to some degree, whether you want to admit it or not. You're not sacrificing it under Israel's system. You're recognizing a distinction between the Old and the New Testaments. To some degree, all of you guys that are criticizing me, you guys are dispensational. Maybe not as much as I am, but you are engaging in some dispensational reasoning. Okay. Many Christians settled for dimly observing a few obvious distinctions, but, but a worthy and scholarly research of the Bible had been revived during the last century by John Nelson Darby, Charles H. McIntosh, William, Ken, uh, William Kelly, Frederick Grant, and others who developed what is known as the Plymouth Brethren Movement, these men had not deviated from the historic faith, Chafer clarified, but recovered the core dispensational distinctions per, uh, propounded by the biblical writers and church fathers. By 1936, the term dispensationalism had accumulated such ill repute among fundamentalists that Schaefer used the term reluctantly. He suffered its use, but he wanted to steal the epitaph away from his fundamentalist opponents and turn it into a positive position. So Schaefer is going to take the word and try to flip it, okay, to try to make it more positive. To that end, his reflections in the heat of the controversy laid the groundwork for what would become his crowning achievement, an eight-volume defense of dispensationalism titled simply Systematic Theology. That's this set right here I have back here uh, on my bookshelf. By outlining a dispensational anth anthropology, soteriology, and exegetical theology to establish his orthodox credibility, 
Chafer made the case for dispensationalism's improvement over older Protestant traditions in the, quote, recovery of vital truth in the Reformation. Chafer wrote of church history in 1936, quote, dispensational distinctions like various doctrines were not emphasized. The, tr the truths thus neglected in the Reformation have since been set forth by devout Bible students, but against the opposition of those who assume that the Reformation secured all that is germane to systematic theology. So he's saying, look, you guys haven't reformed far enough. The Reformation was great. Good truths were recovered, but it didn't go far enough. And he's saying this resurgence of dispensational truth is a new Reformation, if you will, a new step that was left undone by the reformers. That's the way he's casting the dispensational movement, okay? Critics of dispensationalism that Chafer rebutted were not much different than the ones Morrow made to define the theological system a decade earlier. Chafer nevertheless enumerated those criticisms. Dispensationalism was of recent origin. It resembled modernist higher criticism and it's willing to, quote, divide biblical truth. It produced passive Christians and a cheap doctrine of salvation by grace. It was a bastardized form of premillennialism. The points and rhetoric resembled earlier attacks on new premillennialism, but shaped, <clears throat> excuse me, in the context of, of movement polarization and offered far more precision on what dispensational claimed to be. Conversely, how those who were arrayed against it differed. So, Chafer is going to be a very important figure in the history of dispensationalism, okay? From the scattered letters of fundamentalism, the demons of discontent were everywhere in, the 19, by, in 1936. The fundamentalist-modernist controversy had cooled as fighting among fundamentalists heated up. Dispensationalism now attached to a particular subset of fundamentalists survived the early attempts at its marginalization. It was now poised to be a key contender in the coming struggle for the soul of fundamentalism. So that concludes um, the chapter here on, um, that concludes Hummel's chapter on scholastic dispensationalism. The influence of Schaefer should not be underestimated. Schaefer is a hugely important figure in the history of dispensationalism in the United States, okay? Schaefer's book here from 19, uh, 1917, 1918, the, let me see, what's the date here on this? 1915, uh, The Kingdom in History and Prophecy is a majorly important book as well. And again, this is just a theolog theology book. He's not interacting culturally or politically with anything that is going on. He's seeking to stake out a position on the issue of the kingdom um, in this particular book. Before I go, let me point you in the direction for where you can get additional information on this, okay? Um, two lessons in the Grace History Project deal with Lewis Berry Chafer and the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. The first one here is Lesson 88, Lewis Berry Chafer and the founding of Dallas Theological Seminary. That's going to elaborate a little bit more, as well as this Lesson 89, the legacy and impact of Lewis Berry Chafer. So if you want to know more about the subjects covered in this video, please check out Lesson 88 and 89 from the Grace History Project. I'll leave links in the description for this video if you're interested in that. Before I go, as always, the most important decision that you can ever make is whether or not you're saved and whether or not you've trusted Jesus Christ in his death, burial, resurrection as the only payment for your sin. The facts of the gospel are simple. God loves you and Christ died for your sin. God sent Jesus Christ into the world so that he could suffer and make satisfaction, shed his blood on the cross to satisfy the offended justice of God against sin so that he could offer you and I eternal life as a free gift. Salvation is not earned. It's non-meritorious. You can't go to church enough, keep the law enough, give enough money, help little old ladies across the street. None of that is going to make you right in the eyes of Almighty God. Jesus Christ died for your sin, was buried and rose again the third day. Trust the finished work of Christ as the only payment for your sin. And why don't you consider doing that today before it's everlasting too late? Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next time.